Hey everyone, I'm Mr. A, and today we're going to talk about different segment relationships that are formed when chords intersect in a circle. The first one we'll look at is the relationship between the segments of the chords themselves when they intersect. Let's say we have a circle and two chords that intersect in that circle. It's not important where these chords intersect, so I intentionally made this look like it's not at the center. The center is probably somewhere over here. It would be okay if they did intersect at the center, but it's boring because then these are all radii. So what we're interested in is what happens when the chords intersect at some place other than the center. So it turns out that it's always true that the product of the segments of one chord is equal to the product of the segments of the other chord. That sounds a little bit wordy, but if I go ahead and label some things, you can see it's real simple. Let's call those two pieces A and B, and let's call those two pieces C and D. So when I say the product of the segments of one chord, I'm talking about the two segments that this chord is divided into by the other chord. So A and B are two segments of one chord, C and D are the two segments of the other chord. And all we're saying is that the product of the segments of one chord, A times B, is equal to the product of the segments of the other chord, C times D. And this relationship is going to hold for any time you have a circle with two chords that intersect anywhere in that circle. Let's take a look at a few examples of how we can apply this, and then I'll show you why this relationship is true. Here's a pretty straightforward application. We have a circle with two chords that intersect, and we're given the lengths of some of these segments. The first thing I'd like to do is identify which segments belong to the same chord. So these are the two segments of this chord, and three and six are the segments of the other chord. Since the product of the segments of one chord has to equal the product of the segments of the other chord, 2x is equal to 18 and x equals 9. And that's really all there is to it. Here's another quick example. Again, the first thing I'll do is identify the two segments of the one chord, x and 3, and the two segments of the other chord, 9 and 5. Since the product of the segments of one chord must equal the product of the segments of the other, 3x is 45 and x is 15. Oftentimes with these types of problems, you'll end up with quadratic equations. Because we're multiplying, if both segments of one chord contain a variable, you're going to end up with a quadratic. In this case, x and x plus 4 are segments of the same chord, and 16 and 2 are segments of the other chord. Since we know the product of the segments of one chord has to equal the product of the segments of the other, we end up with the quadratic x squared plus 4x equals 32. In this case, you have a few options. If you like to factor, this will factor easily. You just get the quadratic equal to 0. It'll factor into x plus 8 times x minus 4, which gives you two solutions, negative 8 and 4. Now, since this is a geometry problem, we're going to have to reject that negative 8 because this can't be negative 8, this length over here. That means we would get only one solution, x equals 4. The other option would be to complete the square. I've got a whole video on completing the square, and I'll put the link to that in the description. But the short version is that you have an x by x square, and you have this 4x here, which I'll split up into two pieces, 2x over here and 2x over here. Then I complete the square by filling in this little corner, which is an extra 4 units of area. And what this picture tells me is that an x plus 2 by x plus 2 square is equal to the original area of 32 plus the 4 that I added. If I take the square root of both sides, I'll get x plus 2 is plus or minus the square root of 36, which is of course just 6, which means x is negative 2 plus 6 or negative 2 minus 6. Negative 2 minus 6 is a negative number, so for the same reason as before, we would reject that, and we'll end up with the one solution of x equal to 4. But why is it that the product of the segments of one chord are equal to the product of the segments of the other chord? So here we have a circle, and I've just got two chords intersecting, nothing special. I've labeled the intersection C because I'm not going to assume it's the center of the circle. As is often the case when I'm trying to prove one of these theorems, I'll start by adding in some extra chords here. So I'm going to put a chord between A and B and a chord between D and E. Now as soon as I add those two chords, I get two triangles here, and I also get a lot of inscribed angles. For example, angle D and angle A here. Notice that both of those angles are inscribed to the same arc, arc BE. That means that A and D have to be congruent because they're both half of whatever the measure of arc BE is. Likewise, angle B and angle E are both inscribed angles, and since they're both inscribed to arc AD, they also have to be congruent because they're inscribed to the same arc, so they're each half of arc AD. Now we see that triangle ABC is similar to triangle DEC by angle-angle triangle similarity. That means we can write a proportion with the corresponding sides. Now, the dotted lines didn't used to be there, so I'm going to ignore those two, and I'll write a proportion with these other pieces. Let's start here with AC. AC over something is going to be equal to something over something else. AC is in the top triangle. It's in between the red and the unmarked angle. So it corresponds to whatever part of the bottom triangle is in between the red and the unmarked angle. That would be DC. Now I go back to the top triangle and I grab the only other side I care about, which is CB. CB, of course, is in between the blue angle and the unmarked angle, which means it corresponds to the side between the blue angle and the unmarked angle in the other triangle. That would be CE. Now that we have this proportion, we can take the product of the means equal to the product of the extremes. 
In other words, we'll cross multiply. When we do that, we get AC times CE is equal to DC times CB. But notice that AC and CE, these are the two segments of chord AE, and DC and CB are the two segments of the chord DB. So we have the product of the segments of one chord equal to the product of the segments of the other chord. And there you have it. So now we understand why this relationship is true, and we've seen a few examples of how to use it in a circle. For the second part of this video, we're going to look at a specific instance of two chords intersecting where one of those chords is a diameter and they form a right angle between them. So it turns out that any chord perpendicular to a diameter or a radius will be bisected by that diameter or radius. In other words, these two segments have to be congruent. I'm going to take you through a few examples of how we can use this relationship and also prove to you why it's true, but before that, I just want to offer you a quick convincer. If you think about the symmetry of a circle, if I were to turn this circle so that the diameter is vertical, up and down, well, then if this line is perpendicular to the diameter, clearly this line is horizontal. But because of the symmetry of a circle, whatever's on the left-hand side of this diameter has to exactly be the mirror image of whatever's on the right-hand side of the diameter. So clearly, PB has to be the mirror image of AP, that could only be true if these two segments are congruent. That should be enough to at least convince you in your gut that this relationship should be true. Let's take a look at a few examples, and I'll show you an actual proof with congruent triangles so we can establish that this is really always true. Here we have a circle whose radius is given as 5, and we're being asked to find the length of AB. Take a minute to realize that if I didn't have this right angle, I would not know if this side of the chord is the same length as this side. But since this is a right angle, this chord is perpendicular to the diameter, and that means I know that the chord is bisected by the diameter. These two segments have to be congruent. So whatever this one is, I could call it x, this one's going to have to be the same thing, x. Since we know that the radius is 5, this piece over here has to be 5 as well. Now I'll show you two ways that we can finish this problem from here. So one way we could finish this problem is to notice that if the radius is 5, this also has to be 5 since this is a radius, but since this part is 3, this piece over here would have to be 2. And now I can treat this as two chords intersecting in a circle, just like we did for the first part of this video. Now be careful here, this segment of the chord is actually 5 plus 3, or 8. So we would have 8 times 2 is equal to x squared. That means 16 is equal to x squared, and x is 4. Notice I'm only taking the positive solution here, because this can't be a negative distance. Now be careful, the answer isn't 4, because they're looking for the length of AB, and AB is actually 2x, so that means AB is 8. So that's pretty quick and easy, right? Here's another way we could tackle the same problem. Still using the fact that this chord gets bisected, instead of putting this 5 here for the radius, I could instead draw in a radius that isn't there to begin with. So if I were to add a radius here, say, from the center over to B, well, that would also have to be 5 because it's a radius of the circle. But now can you see that I have a right triangle and I'm only missing one side? That means we can use Pythag. x squared plus 3 squared is 5 squared, which means x squared plus 9 is 25, x squared is 16, and we get 4 for x once again, which means that AB is 8 just like the last time. Either of these are perfectly good ways to solve this problem. I would argue that this is the simpler method since you don't have to add anything to the picture. However, by just adding a radius, you can turn this into a simple Pythag, and you might find that more comfortable. Here's another example of the same idea in practice. We have a chord here, perpendicular to this diameter, which means that these two segments have to be congruent. Let's call them both x. We know that this piece is 4, we don't know this piece, but this piece is 10. Now since this is a radius, that means this has to be 10 as well, which means this missing chunk has to be 6. At this point, you can add a radius in and use Pythag just like we did last time, or you can treat this as intersecting chords. Notice that this segment is 16. Knowing that the product of the segments of one chord has to equal the product of the segments of the other, we get 64 equal to x squared, which means x equals 8. But remember, they're looking for AB, which is 2x, so AB is 16. Here's an example of a nice type of word problem we can ask now that we know this relationship between perpendicular chords and diameters. So let's say we have a circle whose radius is 13. How far from the center would a 24 centimeter chord be? We're going to need a picture for this one. So I'm going to draw my circle and put the chord in. I always like to make my chord on an angle so I don't assume anything, but you can certainly make it horizontal. There's nothing wrong with that. So what I'm trying to find out is how far from the center of the circle the chord needs to be. A good place to start would be to put the center of the circle and connect it to the chord. Now remember, how do we measure distance? Has to be at a right angle, right? If I don't measure directly to the chord at a right angle, I'll get a longer number if I go off to the side. So that means that this line connecting the center of the circle to the chord has to be perpendicular to that chord. That means these two pieces have to be congruent because a chord perpendicular to a diameter gets bisected. Now you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, Mr. Ray, that's not a diameter, it's just a little segment. You're not wrong, but remember, this line I could always extend. If I kept going in this direction, and I kept going in this direction, it would be a diameter. 
So even though it's only a part of the diameter, it's still true that if the whole diameter was there, this chord would be perpendicular to it. So I get to invoke this relationship just the same. They told me the chord was 24 centimeters long, which means each half is going to have to be 12. They also told me the radius of the circle. Now when I add the radius, I could add lots of radii into this circle, but I want to pick one that'll make my life easy. So I either want to add a radius to this corner, or I want to add a radius to this corner. That way you're going to get a right triangle. And of course the radius is 13 because they told me that in the problem. The question was, how far away from the center of the circle would the chord need to be? So that's the distance I'm looking for. And of course we can find that with Pythag. So x squared plus 12 squared equals 13 squared. That means that x squared is going to be equal to 25 and x is 5 centimeters in this case. Don't forget those units because we're talking about centimeters and they're asking me for a distance. So if this distance is 5, then the chord will be exactly 24 centimeters long. By the way, if you wanted to, you could have solved this as a product of segments of two intersecting chords. If you extend this little piece here in both directions, then you'll get the full diameter and you can work out what this piece is, that would be x plus 13, and you can work out what this piece is. This is 13 minus x because the radius is 13 and this part of it is x. So if you take away x, you'll be left with this part, which is 13 minus x. Then of course you can do this piece times this piece is equal to this piece times this piece. You'll get a quadratic, and when you solve it, the positive solution will be 5. So you can see why I think this is a much easier path to go, just adding in the radius and doing Pythag. But of course, any correct solution to a mathematical problem is a fine way to approach it. I've got one more example similar to this one, and we'll talk about why this is true. Here again, we'll need to draw our own picture. We want to know the length of a chord that's 5 inches away from the center of a circle if the diameter is 26. So again, I always like to draw the chord into the circle first. I find that that gives me a nice reference point, makes it easier to fill in the rest of the information. Here's the center of the circle, and they want to know the length of the chord if it's 5 inches away. Now remember, 5 inches away, that's a distance from the center. That means that we have to measure that distance at a right angle. So that distance is 5. It must be measured at a right angle. It says that the diameter of the chord is 26. That means that if I were to place a radius into this circle, that would be half of a diameter, or 13 and we're trying to find out the length of the chord. Now, of course, this is a right triangle. That's going to easily give me this piece, but the whole chord would be another one there. How do I know that those are both x? Because again, if this chord is perpendicular to this line that goes through the center, if I were to extend that line, it would be a diameter, so this chord is bisected. This piece has to be the same as this piece, and because of that, I can label them both x. If I solve for x, I just need to double that, and I'll have my answer. How am I going to solve for x? Pythag, of course. x squared plus 5 squared is 13 squared, which means x squared is going to be 144 and x is 12. Now be careful. Don't go ahead and box that in as your answer because remember, we want the entire chord and the chord is actually 2x. That means the length of the chord is 24 inches. That's a pretty good set of examples of the type of problems you can have with intersecting chords in a circle. So how do we really know that this chord is bisected by this diameter? Let's think about what's going on here. Since this is a right angle, all four of these are right angles, the first thing I'm going to do is construct two radii this time, one to OA and one to OC. And of course, OA is going to be congruent to OC because all radii are congruent in a circle. Notice that OB is also congruent to itself by the reflexive postulate, and that's significant because these two triangles here share OB as a side. Well, do you see where this is going? Since these are both right triangles, what we have are two right triangles where the hypotenuses are congruent and one pair of the legs are also congruent. That means that these two triangles are congruent by hype-leg triangle congruence. Remember, hype-leg only works for right triangles, and essentially what's happening is we're using Pythag behind the scenes here. Think about it. If these two triangles have the same leg and the same hypotenuse, if I plug into Pythag with those two lengths, whatever they are, I'm going to get the same number for the missing side. That means that these triangles are really side-side-side congruent, and that's kind of what hype-leg is. It's a shortcut and a wink and a nod to side-side-side. But if these triangles are congruent, that means that all the corresponding parts are congruent. That means that AB has to be congruent to BC by CPCTC. And there you have it. We've got a chord that's perpendicular to the diameter, has to be bisected by that diameter. And that'll about do it for problems involving chords and intersecting chords in a circle. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to my channel, feel free to leave a comment below, and as always, have a great day.